All right. So, I think, uh, good evening, by the way, everybody. And uh, before we start, I want to tell you, I think next Wednesday, see, that's going to be the first Wednesday of March, right? So we are going to kick in with our uh, prayer meeting on Wednesday, beginning next Wednesday for the month of March. So that's going to be at 5 o'clock here at the church in the fellowship hall. And then I think after prayer meeting next Wednesday, we're going to go down to the sanctuary because I want to show a movie to you guys. I think I told you about this movie a few weeks ago. Um, so we'll go do that next Wednesday, and then we'll just kind of resume what we're doing the following. Probably not, yeah. So for all the thousands that are watching us tonight, you can, we're sorry we won't be here, but um, you might have to make a reservation. I don't know. Demand is so high. <laughs> Yeah. No, it's humble day, so (laughs) I'm being humbled. (laughs) Oh, yeah, you're all invited to come next week, so, and it's a great movie. I'm excited to show it to you guys. So let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer, and we will get started. (coughs) Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Uh, once again, Lord, for this opportunity to, to be here together with you, with one another. Uh, God, to have the privilege to open your word and to look into it, to enjoy our company together tonight, and, and also knowing at the same time that you are here in, our, in this very room with us this evening. I want to thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you for your son, Jesus for salvation that you've given us, for saving us, Lord, from ourselves. And uh, God, we just want to uh, reaffirm this evening that, that we believe you are the one and only true God and that your Son, Jesus Christ, is the Savior of the world. And we want to embrace that and confess that. We want to live that out in our lives. So, Father, as we do open your word tonight, speak to us, Lord. Show us what to do and what not to do and how to best please you in our lives. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, let's go to chapter 12 of 2 Samuel. Well, we can get the CD of that chapter and send it to him, or you can watch it or whatever, and that might help to explain it. Um, We do have all that available, right? That whole series that we did on Revelation, which was 32 Sundays, I believe. Um, Just, yeah, it's there. Yeah, it's there. They're still there. Yeah. So all you got to do is just look it up, and I'm sure you'll get your answer. Off the top of my head, I can't give you one right now. I'd have to investigate a little bit more. So anyway, let's get back to 2 Samuel, chapter 12. Last uh, Wednesday when we were together, we kind of got the, the uh, gist of <laughs> what, what David had done. Um, with Uriah's wife and then what he did with Uriah in order to try to cover it all up. And, and uh, so this, this week we're going to continue this saga, if you will, of David's life. 
Um, so we'll start in verse 1 of chapter 12. I'm going to go down and read a little bit, and then we'll stop. It says, The Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said to him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished. And it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food, drank from his own cup, and lie in his bosom. It was like a daughter to him. And the traveler came to the rich man, who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. And so David's anger was greatly aroused against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. And he shall restore fourfold for the lamb, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. So God has sent Nathan to David. David, at this point in this story, um, probably is pretty assured that he's going to be able to move on with his life. He's going to be able to cover up what, what happened with Bathsheba and Uriah. Um, he was killed on the battlefield. He'll be a hero, and, and time will go on, and people will forget, and, and he's going to skate, he thinks. But as we mentioned last th uh, Wednesday when we were here, you can't hide from God. You can't hide your actions from God. You know, you can't get in a room and close the door and figure he can't see me from here, you know. Um, I'm amazed that as we look at this story right here, that David wasn't very well aware of that already. I think he was. He had to have been aware that God sees all things. God knows all things. God is everywhere at once. Uh, present at the same time, uh, an amazing, amazing God. Now, Nathan here, it's almost like, you know, we were talking about the Holy Spirit a few weeks ago on Sunday and how the Holy Spirit is the one who convicts us of sin. He's the one that convinces us of our sin that, and convinces us of our need for a Savior He's the one that brings those things to the forefront of our thoughts. And it's almost like Nathan here, uh, who is a prophet, um, it's almost like he's playing a, the role of the Holy Spirit. And, and the Lord sent this prophet, Nathan, to David. And right away, he starts telling this um, story. Now, David doesn't know if it's a fictional story or if it's a real story. So as he's listening to the story, his anger is, he's getting hotter and hotter as he hears this story going on. This rich man that he talks about in verse 2, um, it's interesting how they word that there. He said that he had exceedingly many flocks and herds. Now, you could have just wrote down that he had many flocks and herds. Right? And then we would have got the jest. He was a real rich guy. He had lots of flocks and herds. But the, the scripture adds that word exceedingly in there. That what they're trying to show us here is he had much more than he would ever need in flocks and herds. But yet it tells a lot about this man's heart and his lack of conscience and decency. So he's got a little neighbor living next to him and, you know, down the, down the path a little bit. And, you know, this guy's poor. It tells us he had nothing. Like just one lamb. And it wasn't a lamb that they were raising for food. It was a lamb that was a pet. It was a household pet. And we learn also in the story that this man, 
the poor man, had children. So I'm assuming he had a wife. He had children. They had all had this little lamb in their home, and uh, it was part of the family. Um, it talks about sitting in his bosom, and, you know, my golden retriever is 80 pounds, and he will come up and sit in your bosom. He thinks he's this big, right? He's huge. But, uh, and he'll curl up there and just be nice and comfy. It's all right in the winter because it keeps you warm, you know. Um, but I can see this guy with this little lamb, and it's curled up on his lap. And, and uh, evidently, he's got a lot of serious uh, feelings um, for this lamb. It's much more than just an animal to him. And so in verse 4, he tells us about this man that shows up at the rich man's house. He's a traveler, um, might have been an emissary, might have been an important fella, but he's uh, traveling, and he stops at the rich guy's house, and he wants to show off for the traveler and make him a real nice meal and, you know, be hospitable to him and neighborly or whatever. Um, but instead of going to his own flock and picking one of the uh, lambs from his own flock, he goes to the poor man and takes his lamb from him. Basically, strong arm robs the guy of his lamb. And, and I can hardly think that when that happened, that the guy and his family just sat there and said, oh yeah, go ahead and take it and cook it. I'm sure that there was some objection. I'm sure that there was some pleading that was going on. Please, don't take our lamb. You know, you have lots of lambs. And, but obviously, the man didn't consider that. He didn't heed that whatsoever. It says he refused to take from his own flock and his own herd, just to prepare one lamb. Well, already, you know, when I'm reading this story, I'm getting angry. You know, especially when I'm reading it for the first time, I'm thinking, what a, what a dirty, rotten scoundrel this guy is, that he would do something like that. And David, of course, his anger's growing also. Now, this is probably one of the, ah, my gosh, one of the most potent passages in the Bible. Because David is angry now, and he says that this man deserves to die for what he's done. But before he dies, he's going to restore everything fourfold because he did this thing. And I like how he adds at the end, because he had no pity. And then Nathan looked at David and he said, David, you are the man. Talk about, talk about being busted, right? Talk about not having any wiggle room to get out at all. And we think about what David did and how he went about doing it. And when, uh, when he says in verse 6 that he had no pity, well, David's talking about his own heart here. David's explaining the very thing that was going on in his own heart. He had no pity. He did not have any care for his friend Uriah or for Uriah's wife. In his self-righteous kingly judgment, he's going to make this right. <laughs> and Nathan tells him, surprise, it's you, David. You are that man. Thus saith the Lord, God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel. Look at all the eyes that we go down through here. He doesn't give David credit for any of, any of this. I anointed you the king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul, and I gave your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had not if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. David, you have everything that you will ever need above and beyond what you will ever need, and I would have given you more if you asked 
Why, David, did you do this? You have sinned against God. You've sinned against Uriah. You've sinned against the people. And so he goes on in verse 9 and he says, Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You've killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and you have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. So we know what happened to Uriah. We know that he was in battle. We know that they were fighting and there was a wall there of some sort and, and he was told to go up on closer to the wall and of course he was killed in battle there. And one of the things that maybe stood out to me when I was looking at this in verse 9, it says that he did evil in the sight of the Lord. And it was evil. And he did do it in the sight of the Lord. But what he says before that, I think, is kind of a clue as maybe to what drove him to do it. He said, you have despised the commandments of the Lord. You have shirked it off. You have disregarded the commandment of the Lord. And I think that when people like us that are born again and we're struggling and we begin to let go of the commandments of the Lord, so to speak, we put ourselves in a vulnerable spot that we might fall into evil and do evil against the Lord. When, you, when we sin, we're sinning against God. When we sin, we're, we're judging, in a sense, that God doesn't know what's best for me, so I need to do this because it's best for me, I think, and I'm going to do it. I'm, I'm shirking God's word. And when we do that, it puts us in a vulnerable position in our lives. And look at what David has. David has all of it, and so do we. We have everything that we need. Matter of fact, it says that in the New Testament. It says God has given us all the things that we need to live godly lives in Christ. He's given us the Holy Spirit. He's given us His Word. He's given us a personal relationship with Him. He's given us people around us to bolster us up when we're feeling weak. He's given us eternal life. We have everything we will ever need. But yet, knowing that, but yet knowing that, I might have a short memory. And maybe the lust of my eyes, or maybe the desire for the things of life, or maybe I'm angry and I want revenge, or whatever it might be, uh, cheating on my taxes, or whatever it might be, you know, um, we find ourselves vulnerable to those situations when we loosen our grip and when we begin to forget that we have everything that we need. What do you lack in Christ? We lack nothing. As a matter of fact, as the church, we are his prized possession. We are his bride. He's very protective of us. And he has a great plan for his bride. We don't have a clue of how magnificent and wonderful it's going to be when that day finally comes and we're called up to heaven to be with him at the wedding feast of the Lamb. And we'll be dressed in, you know, white garments So there's the question again. In Christ, what do we lack? And we would say, nothing. We have everything and more. Well, then why do we loosen our grip? Why do we take our eyes off the Lord and put our eyes on circumstances, situations? And it's so easy to do. Someone's sick in our family, and we're just so worried about it, we can't even eat. 
Why can't we just say, you know what, God? You know how I love them. You know what my heart is, Lord. So knowing that, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it over to you. I'm going to let you have that. Or a little story I'll tell you real quick. I was standing at a 7-Eleven or something one day. And there was a girl in front of me, and she was rifling through her purse trying to find money. And as she was going through the money, there was probably five or six people waiting in line there. And she dropped a $20 bill on the floor right at my feet. Didn't know it. Nobody behind me knew it. I saw it fall right before my feet. And I thought, ooh. $20 $20 bill. And then I thought better of that. So I picked it up and I tapped her on the shoulder. I said, I think you dropped this. And she turned around and of course the expression on her face was priceless. Thank you so much for being honest. You know, most people would have just picked that up and slipped it into their pocket and left. There's a good example right there of, of you come into a fork in the road where you're going to choose to do the right thing or not to do the right thing. And I could stand there and I could say, you know what, I'm going to get away with this. No one's going to know it. And I'm going to have dinner on this lady tonight, right? Or whatever. Fill my gas tank, whatever. Or I can bless her and give it back to her and do the right thing. Because... If I do that, then I know that God's going to bless me much more than just with a $20 bill. Right? His favor will rest on us when we do the right thing. And David has forgotten that whole principle um, in his relationship with the Lord. And not only... Does Nathan expose the sin of David? He also tells David what the consequences are going to be for his sin. So Nathan said to David, you're the man. And we go down to uh, verse 10. And Nathan is speaking to him and he says, Now therefore, he's speaking for the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. The sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. So that's the first thing that he pronounces to David. Yours is going to be a bloody throne and not just in your life. This is going to filter down into generations way after you're gone. The sword will never depart from your house. And thus saith the Lord, verse 11, Behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house. And I will take your wives before your eyes, and I will give them to your neighbor, and he will lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. Not not hiding, right out in the open, Your family is going to take your wives and lie with them in front of the whole public. Now that's pretty scary right there. Verse 12. Now here's the motto for you and me tonight after our little topic here. Here it is. You did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all of Israel, before the sun. It's going to be exposed. Everybody's going to know about it. You're kind of a fraud, David. Hypocrite is too nice of a word. And everyone is going to know what you've done. Now, up to this point, I haven't heard David say one thing about his guilt. I haven't David seen David express any remorse or any humility because he's so pompous in his mind now that he thinks he's going to get away with it until Nathan comes on the scene. And look at verse 13. 
finally he confesses. I have sinned against the Lord. Now you might remember when David was listening to Nathan tell the story. David pronounced judgment on this fictional man. And what was the judgment? He will surely die. He basically announced his own sentence. Right? He was, he was judging himself. Didn't even know it. He was just like Uriah was carrying the message from David to Joab out on the battlefield. Uriah is carrying his own death sentence to the commander of the army and doesn't even know it. So David says, I've sinned against the Lord. And what that means, David, is that you should surely die. It should cost you your life because you pronounced judgment on this man and you are the man. Now this shows that God's plan, sometimes we get off track with what God's plan might be for our lives, but He has an amazing way of bringing us back around again. He has an amazing way of fulfilling His plan in spite of me, in spite of my mistakes, in spite of my poor judgment, my struggles that I might have. And so Nathan says to David, The Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. So, is there a difference between what the Lord has done here for David and what Jesus did for us concerning our sin? Is there a difference? Is what the Lord is speaking to David through Nathan, is it different than what God's speaking to me through Jesus? I think it is. I think it's quite different. We know, as Christians, being born again, that our sins aren't just put away. Our sins are washed away. Our sins are thrown into the sea of forgetfulness. Our sin, God said, I will remember them no more. He's not just put away our sin. And, and in a sense, the sacrificing of animals during the Old Testament times, that's as much as it could accomplish. It was a temporary covering for their sin. It, it didn't remove it. It just put it away. It just covered it up through the sacrifices, which... We know now, looking back on all of this, that all of those sacrifices were pointing to the very Son of God, Jesus, and what He would come to do in God's time. I've cast your sin as far as the east is from the west. Wow, that's pretty amazing. How far is that? It is infinite. Why is it infinite? That's right. If you're going east to west, you're going to go west for a while, and then you're going to wind up going east. You can measure that one, right? God's so smart. But if we're going north and south, if I head north, I'm going to continue. Or I'm sorry. I got that backwards. If I'm heading north, there's going to come a time when I'm going to be heading south. That's limited. If I start heading east, there'll never be a time when I'm going west. I'll be going east forever. I'm sorry, I got that flip-flop there. Um, but a great illustration of what God says concerning our sin. As far as the east is from the west... They will be thrown into eternity, and I will remember them no more. So does that mean that we can go out and practice sin 
and not have to worry about consequences of it? Well, we know better than that, don't we? And even though we know better than that, sometimes we think we can maybe slide in and out of that a few here and there times. But God always sees. He always knows what we're doing. The child, Bathsheba's pregnant. She's going to have a baby. But that baby was conceived in deception and lies and, and, and adultery. And so verse 14 he begins to pronounce sentence. However, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also who is born to you will surely die. And then David said, or Nathan said to David, Have a good day. I'm going home. Nathan departs. Enjoy the rest of your day, David, because the jig is up. So there's something here in verse 14, too, that's kind of interesting. We talked about this last week when we talked about throwing a, a pebble into a pond and how it gets that rippling effect and how when we sin, a lot of times it's like throwing a pebble into a pond. And that rippling effect goes out from us and it affects other people around us. It can be a tsunami that just wipes people out. Most of the time the people that get wiped out are the people that are closest to us. The ones that we love, supposedly. And what do other people, not even in my, perhaps my family or whatever, my peers or my people that I know at work or people that I know, my neighbors or whatever, and they know that I'm this Christian and they know that I go to church and then they hear that I did a bank robbery or a murder or, you know, something terrible, stole the car, uh, whatever it might be, was unfaithful. Some Christian you are, right? He said he was a Christian I knew he was phony. This whole God thing, you know, it's just kind of a joke. That's why I don't go to church. Because people are like that. They say one thing and they do another. They're literally blaspheming the Lord as they're condemning me and you for what we've done. And that's the thing that uh, Nathan's pointing out here. You have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. Because of what you've done. I thought David was God's guy. I thought David was a man after God's heart. I thought David was anointed to be the king of Israel. Satan is always there just waiting for an opportunity to accuse us. And sometimes he accuses us and we deserve it. You know, it's almost like, you know, you had that coming. You are guilty and you know it. It's one thing to be accused, but it's another thing to be condemned. Satan might think that he can convince you when you fall that you're condemned. But he can't do that. He doesn't have the authority to do that. There's only one person that has the authority to condemn you. And that's Jesus. That's all. You can't condemn someone else. I can't condemn anybody. And that's exactly what Jesus is talking about in Matthew when he says, don't judge people. He's talking about putting them on trial, finding them guilty, and condemning them like a court of law would. You don't have that right. That's not your privilege. That privilege is reserved for God. But we know that our adversary attempts to condemn us, to make us believe that, he, that we're condemned because of what we've done. So how many Christians are living like that? How many people are trying to go to church, live a godly life, but yet something's happened in their life and the enemy's been pounding on them and they're starting to believe this, this lie that they are condemned by God? Condemned to death. 
He's the accuser of the brethren, the Bible says. And the sisterin. Right? He accuses us. He did the same thing when it came to Job. When he, when he saw God and he said, yeah, that Job guy, man, you know. You give everything to him on a silver platter. Just take some of that stuff away and watch what he does. He'll, he'll curse you. And I don't know if you've ever read the book of Job. It's kind of a hard book to read because it's so long. But he gets nothing but bad advice from his buddies. All the way through the book. They, they don't understand what's going on. And the advice they keep telling David, or uh, <coughs> you must have done something wrong. You must, have, you must have did something against God, Job. Otherwise, this wouldn't be happening to you. And Job's like, I don't know what I've done. I've done everything that I thought was right. And, oh, you're, gotta be, you're hiding something there. And a lot of times, that's what you hear from people. You having a tough time in your life? Are you sick? You know, you know why you're sick, don't you? You're harboring some sin. You're, you're trying to cover up a sin. You're, you're, you're holding bitterness and hatred in your heart. And not only that, you don't have much faith. If you had enough faith, and if you would confess that sin, you wouldn't be sick. Have you ever heard anybody say that? I've heard it. I actually heard somebody say that about my daughter-in-law when she had cancer. They actually approached her and told her, if you just had enough faith, maybe you're harboring some sin, but if you just had enough faith, God would heal you. And I'll be honest with you, that made me very, very angry that they would have the, I'm not going to say courage, but audacity, thank you, to do something like that. So it's important because you represent God. You represent Jesus Christ. We are ambassadors of the Lord. So if we're there representing Him and we're acting like idiots, we're just having a terrible witness to people, all that does is just deflate their feelings about God. Or it just reinforces their feelings that they've already had about God. It's when we live godly lives in front of people around us. That's when, the, that's when the difference is made in other people's lives when they see that. So Nathan departed the house. And the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David. And it became ill. Therefore David pleaded with God for the child. And David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. And so the elders of his house arose and went to him and to raise him up from the ground, but he would not, nor did he eat food with them. And then on the seventh day it came to pass that the child died. And the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, Indeed, while the child was alive, we spoke to him, and he would not heed our voice. How can we tell him that the child is dead. He may do some harm. Do some harm, I'm assuming, to himself. And when David saw that his servants were whispering, he perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said to his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, Yeah, he is dead. So David arose from the ground, and he washed and anointed himself. And he changed his clothes, and he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. And then he went to his own house. And when he requested, they set food before him, and he ate. Interesting pattern right there, isn't it? An interesting pattern. While the child was yet alive, perhaps God would change his mind. So I was fasting and praying for the child's life. And now the child is dead, and instead of 
the morning thing that you would expect. David gets up, washes himself, eats, and he explains why he does that. Verse 21, his servant said, what is this that you've done? <laughs> Very unusual, David, to respond like that. You fasted and you wept for the child while he was alive. But when the child died, you arose and ate food. That just seems out of character, David. How could you do that? Isn't that kind of disrespectful, in a sense? And David said, while the child was alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who could tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now that he's dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Now that's real logic, isn't it? While the child was sick, I passed, fasted, I prayed, I sought the Lord. That perhaps the Lord would touch the child and heal it. But, you know, I've had people come to me when they've lost a loved one over, uh, a few times over the years. And you know what they'll ask me to do? Would you please pray for the loved one that I lost? Will you pray for them, you know, that God will let them into heaven? So that when I get there, I could be with them. And that's a very hard thing to answer. But the truth of the matter, and this is what David is seeing right here, it's too late. It doesn't matter if I spent four months praying for that person. It's too late. They've lived their life. They're going to be accountable for what they've done, for whether or not they became born again or not, and put their trust in Jesus Christ. Please pray for my loved one who died. You know, I'd rather pray for you. I'd rather pray, pray that God would speak to your heart through this and, and uh, that you would come to have a relationship with him. Because when somebody asks you that question, you've got to wonder, how can they have a relationship with the Lord and ask me a question like that? Can't say either way. But it, you can't, yeah, you can't do anything for them. They're gone. It's appointed unto man once to die, and then judgment. There's no second chances. There's no purgatory. Now, this particular portion of Scripture right here, as far as I know, is the very first passage that refers to eternal life. It refers to resurrection. The, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they didn't believe in the resurrection. Especially the Sadducees. They believed that when you die, you're dead, it's over, you're gone. And you don't read a whole lot in the Old Testament about resurrection until you get to the New Testament. <clears throat> so this is one of those occasions right here. I will go to him. There's going to come a day when I'll take my last breath. I will go to him, but he shall not return to me. And so David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went in to her and lay with her. And so she bore a son. And he called his name Solomon. Now the Lord loved him. And he sent word by the hand of Nathan the prophet. So he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. So, um, Solomon is born. Uh, Jedidiah, I'm trying to think. Jedidiah means loved of God. Beloved of God. That's what he named, that's what Jedidiah uh, is. So Solomon is born. Nathan comes and gives him this name that God wants him to have. His name is Jedediah. Now Joab 
Now we turn the page. Now we go back on the battlefield. Joab fought against Rabbah of the people of Ammon and took the royal city. And Joab sent messengers to David and said, I fought against Rabbah, <clears throat> and I have taken the city's water supply. Now therefore gather the rest of the people together and encamp against the city and take it, lest I take the city and it be called after my name. So David gathered all the people together and went to Rabbah and fought against it and took it. And then he took their crown from his head, the king's crown. Its weight was a talent of gold with precious stones, and it was set on David's head. Also he brought out the spoil of the city in great abundance. And he brought out the people who were in it, and he put them to work with saws and iron picks and iron axes, and made them cross over to the brickworks. And so he did to all the cities of the people of Ammon. And then David and all the people returned to Jerusalem. So we got this little interim thing here that's going on. Because we're going to be moving into a, a totally uh, different section um, when we get into the next chapter. Now a couple of things I want to point out. There are four different things that we're going to find in our reading through this second Samuel that were a result of David's sin. We're talking about consequences. We're talking about rippling effect. Now Absalom, Absalom was the third son of David with Maaka. And Absalom means uh, father of peace. Cool name. So we're going to read in a couple of chapters some things that are going to be happening. First of all, David has lost his newborn. That's the first thing as a result of his sin. The next thing that's going to happen is that his daughter, his virgin daughter, Tamar, is going to be raped by her uh, half-brother, Absalom. And Ammon is going to be so enraged towards Absalom for what he did that Ammon is going to take vengeance out uh, and murder Abs uh, I'm sorry. Absalom's going to take vengeance and murder Amnon. And then finally, Absalom is going to turn against David. And Absalom will be killed in battle. So these four events are going to be taking place in the next few chapters. But they're all a direct result of David's sin. So, uh, well, actually, if, let's just look at one of the, real quick, one of the prophecies that we read in here about David... Uh, and his wives. We just read it a few minutes ago. It's over in verse 11. But if you look over at uh, chapter 16, when you get over to Second Samuel chapter 16, look at verse 22. Sometimes the consequences of our behavior catches up with us really quick. We'll start in verse 20. Absalom says to Ahithophel, Give advice as to what we should do, because David has left now. He's abandoned the place. Ahithophel says to Absalom, Go into your father's concubines, whom he has left to keep the house. All of Israel will hear that you are abhorred by your father, and then the hands of all who are with you will be strong. So they pitched a tent for Absalom, on the top of the house. And Absalom went into his father's concubines in the sight of all of Israel. That's exactly what Nathan told him was going to happen. And it happens just within a couple chapters. It appears to happen pretty quick. But all of these things, all of these consequences that we read about here 
uh, in our text, we're all going to see all of them come to pass. You know, when God says something, He means it. When, when God speaks, you can, you can bank that it's, it's going to be true and accurate. It's amazing how He is able to just move things around in order to accomplish His Word. People, people get moved around by Him. It's happening in the world today. You know, God's sitting up there in heaven and he's moving these world leaders around. He's putting them over here and he's putting this one over here and he's raising some up and he's taking some down. And it's all interconnected with his plan for end times. It's pretty exciting when you look at it in that way. I, I look at it sometimes through my natural eyes and I just get mad. I have nightmares, yeah. It's kind of like a living nightmare, isn't it? It's hard to realize how somebody can have so much authority and be so stupid. But we see it here too. I guess people haven't changed much over the years. So anyway, we'll continue this. Uh, let's see, next week we're going to be down there. So it'll be a couple weeks and we'll get back at it. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, I want to thank you for our time. Thank you for these folks that came out this evening uh, in spite of the snow. Pray, God, that you get them home safely. Be with them and bless them, Lord. And Father, as we go through the rest of our week, let us be reminded that the things that we do, the things that we say, can have a great witness for you or it can bring about horrible consequences. So, God, we want to make good choices. We want to do the things that would bring glory to you. We want to do the things that would prove to onlookers that we're new creatures in Christ, that we're not the same. That we respond to calamity and problems differently than we used to because we trust you. You have all things in hand. You have us in the palm of your hand. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. All right.